Thank you for joining this episode of our webinar series on best practices in e-discovery and digital forensics. I'm really excited about today's session and our guest speaker for a few reasons. First, we see on a weekly basis law firms becoming victims of cybercrime. The most common exploit we see is business email compromise where someone's email gets hacked and then subsequent phishing email attacks from that email account. Fortunately, we've got the safeguards in place to protect our employees and our clients' data from these exploits. Law firms are repositories of valuable, confidential information and are under constant attack. You'll learn from our guest speaker why it's critical to adopt a cyber secure mindset in your firm. When dealing with document intensive cases, you're likely going to encounter malware and need to address that threat. In today's session, we'll cover the threats to watch out for, best practices to secure your firm, and best practices to handle document intensive cases safely. My name is Jeff Fugit. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer for Lexby, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. We've got a ton of information to get to in today's session, so I'll jump right in. Our webinars take place monthly and cover a variety of relevant e-discovery and digital forensic topics, trends, best practices, and strategies. We've got limited seating, so be sure to register early for the sessions that are of interest to you. If you have technical issues or questions, please email us at webinars at lexby.com and we'll address those right away. Our webinars are available online at lexby.com for viewing via streaming video or downloadable as a PDF presentation or MP3 podcast. You'll find this webinar and a complete listing of other webinars at lexby.com or on our YouTube channel. If you have any questions during today's session, please enter them in the Q&A portion of the GoToWebinar console and we'll answer them at the end of today's event. To be notified of future live and on-demand events, please email us at webinars at lexby.com or follow us on LinkedIn. For more than 17 years, Lexby's been helping legal teams with limited resources handle document intensive matters. We have the industry's most affordable and full-featured DIY cloud-based e-discovery platform. We have the industry's fastest e-discovery processing and document review platform. And this is really important because that speed means you have more time to build a stronger case. We deliver the industry's fastest return on investment per a study that was done by G2. We are also rated as the e-discovery company that's the easiest to do business with, a high performer, and the easiest to administer. We have a full forensic lab staffed with Celebrite certified forensic investigators who perform full and targeted forensic collections. And if you'd like a demonstration of our platform, simply email us at sales at lexby.com and we'll get that scheduled for you. Joining us today is Darren Mott. Darren is a former supervisory special agent with the FBI Cyber Division. He is also the host of the Cyber Guy and Cyber Smart podcasts. Darren is an innovative and versatile leader with more than 20 years of progressive responsibility and top performance at the FBI in the Charlotte, Cleveland, and Birmingham divisions and within the cyber and counterintelligence divisions at the headquarters. Before I turn it over to Darren, I'm going to ask for your participation in some polling questions to help set the stage for his presentation. And our first polling question is, how concerned are you about cybersecurity threats at your firm? While you're answering that, I'll thank you for participating in our polling questions today. All right, I'll go ahead and close that poll. And our second polling question that we have, have you received malware from a client's files? All right, and I'll go ahead and close that poll. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Darren Mott. Darren? Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all. Uh, in my 20 years working in the FBI, I worked both cyber and counterintelligence with cyber, pretty much working cyber crimes the entirety of my career and looking at counterintelligence the last back half of my career because those two things kind of came together. And a couple of things I have seen over that 20 years is that the legal community law firms are a particularly interesting target to cyber actors, both in the criminal world and the nation state world, simply because of the information you have, the information on the clients you have, 
and the ability to find potentially vulnerable victims that they can then exploit. So when Jeff asked me if I could speak to you all about the cyber threats, I jumped at the opportunity because prior to the FBI, I was a high school teacher. You may say, how does a high school teacher become an FBI agent? That's a conversation we are certainly welcome to have um, if you email me at the end, I'll have my email address. Um, but anyway, um, since I've retired, I've enjoyed being able to continue to educate folks on the needs and the requirements and the things you should do to keep yourself safe in this online world. And in my podcast, one of the things I talk about a lot is if you can understand the threats targeting you, you can assess your cyber risk and then you can proceed wisely. And this presentation hopefully will kind of answer some of those questions for you as far as understanding who is targeting you. Like if you're you may be a small 10 person law firm and you may be, you may think I don't have anything anyone would want. I would warn you against that particular thought process because I guarantee you, if we had a five minute conversation, I could quickly identify something a cyber bad actor would want from your company. So it's going to be all about lowering your cyber risk. You're never going to eliminate it. Cyber is going to be cyber crime, cyber issues are going to be a problem pretty much ad infinitum. If you want to completely eliminate your cyber risks, throw all your computers out, move your business to Antarctica, you'll probably be okay at that point. But let's talk about how to reduce your cyber risk uh, through this particular presentation. Now, the slides I have, I'm not going to read them to you necessarily. That's kind of a guide for me to um, talk about what is on that particular slide. So I always start my presentations with this particular slide, which shows a pyramid of cyber threats. So at the very bottom, you have your tier one attackers. Those are gonna be your script kitties, your people getting new into the cyber bag actor field. And they're fairly easy to defend against. If you have good firewalls, if you have good malware, you're using a good managed service provider to look at your network, they're not gonna do much to you. Where you get into problems is when you get up into this red with the tier five and tier six nation state actors. Now, if you're a retail entity, if let's say you're, um, you know, you're 7-Eleven, chances are China is not really looking to target your infrastructure because they may not have a lot of interest in what it is you have other than the ability to use your network to launch attacks. But as a law firm, and the, the interesting part for nation state actors are your clients because they work in industries that nation states have interest in getting information from, being intellectual property, things like that. So trying to defend yourself against those nation state actors is very difficult. If you don't have a good counterintelligence capability you don't have an offensive capability in your network, then the chance of lowering your cyber risk is pretty limited without a couple extra tools. Now, I have yet in my 20 years in the FBI or my three years in retirement, found any company that really has a good counterintelligence capability outside of the US intelligence community. So, you know, this is, this is why you see a lot of news reports about China and Russia finding access to information and computer networks across all industries because those companies make it, it's very hard for them to defend against that activity. So we're going to talk a little bit about the criminal per perspective. This is the middle groups or more of your cyber crime areas. But I want to talk about the nation state ones first, largely because they're going to cause you the most damage. You know, if someone hits you with ransomware, that can be expensive. Business email compromise, certainly expensive. But if you have a net, you're going to see those results of that activity fairly quickly. If a nation state actor is in your network, you may not know they're there for months, if not years at a time. So I wanna talk real briefly about these advanced persistent threats. This is a term that um, companies outside of the government have created to reference nation state actors. The first one was identified fully by a company called Mandiant in 2013. And right now, um, FireEye, which used to be Mandiant, tracks 41 active uh, advanced persistent threats. So these are largely um, groups that are affiliated with nation states, not all of them, some of them are criminal entities, but most of them are nation state cyber actors. And what it is, what is it that they want? Well, it depends on who they're coming from. So the four main countries you really have to think about are Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, but they all have different motivations for what it is they're looking at from you or your clients. So let's take a look at Russia real quick and I'll be brief on these. And, I, and at the end, if you want a copy of this PowerPoint, I will provide it to Jeff and he can share it with anyone who wants a copy. So you're, you're welcome to have this. Um, like I said, at the end, you're welcome to contact me directly if you have other questions. But Russia is looking largely for geopolitical intelligence. You know, they want to be a, a global power. They're really not currently. So they'll look for information that is geopolitical in nature. They'll look for economic information, uh, intelligence regarding former Soviet states, obviously with the, the war in Ukraine, that's a big thing for them now. 
Um, but here's a key one for us is intelligence regarding energy resources. So if you have clients that are in the energy sector, then you're going to have Russian actors interested in the information in your clients or in you directly to get to your clients. And then they're looking to do political influence as well as what, what we call uh, advanced hybrid warfare. When there is, and you're seeing that now actually in the Ukrainian war where there are cyber, cyber war, if you will, activities going on between Russia and Ukraine. As we get into larger conflicts in the future, you're gonna see a lot more of this advanced hyper warfare where you have actual bullets running and you have digital bullets running on the internet trying to take down communications and things like that. So China, you are looking at intellectual property. That's a key one. And something to think about and review in your client portfolio is what companies rely on their intellectual property as part of their huge business model, because China will steal it. Doesn't matter what it is. I mean, you can think, oh, they're only stealing jet airplane information. They are stealing everything. There was a case in San Francisco roughly 10 years ago, and what China stole uh, through an insider, and we'll talk about insider threat in a bit, was titanium dioxide. Now, I'll give you all a minute to think about what is where do you find titanium dioxide most commonly, and where you find them is in your toothpaste and in the cream filling of Oreo cookies. Titanium dioxide is the thing that makes those things white. And so you could say, why does anybody care about the cream filling in Oreo cookies other than it tastes fabulous? Well, the Chinese wanted that formula so they could duplicate it and provide it to market to basically make money for their Chinese oriented company. So intellectual property, a key thing with China. And here's another one, especially in the legal community is business regard or intelligence regarding business dealings. In other words, if you've got a company that is looking to do business in China, prior to those negotiations, Chinese state nation actors will try to infiltrate your network to look for what your business idea is. What are you going to bid for the project? Things like that so that they can have an idea of what you're coming in with. They can have a plan to undercut it, things like that. Uh, they're looking for political influence. Obviously, they want to be the hegemonic leader in the world over the U.S. And they look for intelligence regarding the five poisons. So those five poisons are these things, the Uyghurs, Tibetans, Fulong Gong, Chinese democracy, and Taiwan, Taiwanese independence. If you're not dealing with any of those things, not a big risk for you. Um, but those are kind of the, the key things that China looks for. From Iran, I will say Iran and North Korea, if you're in the legal community. These are going to be your lower level threats. You don't have to spend a lot of bandwidth on dealing with, um, but they're looking for information on nuclear weapons development. So if you have a client that is in this industry, something to think about as far as Iran possibly targeting your client. Furtherance of regional terrorism goals and regime protection. Those are the three big things for Iran. Actually, there's a fourth one. <laughs> they're still also uh, gas and oil. So if you have clients in the gas and oil community, just understand that in addition to Russia, Iran's going to be a potential target. So North Korea, again, probably your, your smallest threat to worry about from a nation state perspective. You've got, they do do a couple interesting things. They are the only nation state or the, the, the key nation state that hacks for economic gain. The other entities hack for regime gain, but North Korean, obviously being a um, hermit state, needs money. So they will, you, they will do ransomware and other things to hack clients, to get them to pay the ransomware, to get money to help fund the regime. So you will see that with North Koreans. Um, they're looking to protect the regime, obviously, and they'll hack regional adversaries. So really, from a, from North Korea perspective, ransomware is gonna be your issue from them, um, but that can kind of go in the same bucket as your criminal actors and what they're kind of doing. So these are just some headlines I pulled just to kind of show the depth and breadth of cyber activity and the cyber risk that is targeting law firms and the legal community. So this is one, they're increasingly being targeted by cyber criminals. Ransomware attacks take aim at law firms. Legal industry faces double jeopardy as a favorite cybercrime target. target. Uh, protecting confidentiality. So the urge need to, for strong cybersecurity. So kind of like where we're having this conversation, there is an understanding that cybersecurity needs to be an enhanced thought process within law firms because your data is being targeted. I worked in Cleveland as a supervisor on a cyber squad. We were constantly, every six months roughly, going to one of the largest law firms in Cleveland um, and they were part of a conglomerate that had law firms located um, all over the country uh, because they were getting a data breach somewhere. Someone was clicking a link, someone was doing something incorrectly, and bad guys were getting into their systems. And the key thing here to really understand when it comes to cyber crime or cyber intrusions, as we call them, is that bad guys aren't necessarily hacking in. What we think of hacking in where they find a vulnerability in a piece of software or a piece of hardware 
they utilize that vulnerability to magically get into the back door of a network and then root around and do stuff. What they're doing really is logging in. They're getting legitimate credentials from individuals who have accounts on your network and getting in that way. And I'll talk about kind of how that happens as we go for further. And then the key one, the dangers of a data breach at your law firm is more than just the loss of client confidentiality. It's going to be your reputation. It's going to be a whole host of things that can really cause you problems if someone gets into your network and you're not really on the lookout for that activity. An interesting stat I don't have anywhere in this, in this PowerPoint, but I'll mention it here, is that the average time it takes for any business to understand that someone is actually in their network doing bad stuff is roughly 300 days. So by the time a bad guy gets into your network, is exfiltrating data, is reading your emails, doing all that stuff, you may not realize it for up to 300 days, and it may not even be you who realizes it. It may be law enforcement who comes and knocks on your door and said, hey, is this your data? You say, yeah, that looks familiar. And then and the bad stuff happens at that point. So a couple stats specifically for law firms in the legal community. One in four law firms have experienced a security breach of some kind. So for the people on this webinar, there's at least one in four of you who've had some kind of security breach. Probably business email compromise would be my key thought on what it is you probably got hit with, maybe ransomware. But my other guess is there are people, possibly people in your network, you do not realize are there doing things to compromise your data, your client's data, or use your network to launch attacks against someone else. Data breaches cost about $36,000. Now that is for a local small practice. The average cost for a data breach for, for, if you take all businesses and you combine the loss amount for a data breach, the last number I saw was $4.8 million for a data breach. Now, obviously the smaller firm you are, the less it is, but still $36,000, I believe is the cost for one paralegal for, for, for a year. So you can certainly have a host of different financial ramifications, even with, with that dollar amount of a loss. 31% of clients terminate their relationships with a law firm after data breach. Obviously they, if their data is compromised, they're not going to trust you. They're going to go somewhere else. Now, they may end up coming back ultimately because where they went to got breached. They say, well, let me go back to the first guy because everybody's getting hit. Well, when I was in the bureau, Robert Muller was the, um, assist, uh, the director for a while. And one of the things he said that's kind of stuck with everybody is there's two types of companies in the United States. Those that have had a data breach and those that haven't had a data breach yet or don't know they've had a data breach already. So you're probably you're one of those two. Keep that in mind. 61% of ransomware victims in the legal sector were law firms in 2020. And I would say that the smaller you are, the more likely you are to be compromised simply because you may not have the robust cybersecurity to do some of the simple things that you need to keep your network safe, be it um, employee education, be it strong password management, be it multi-factor authentication. Um, but obviously the less money you put into cybersecurity, the more likely it is you are to be a target. I understand certainly that cybersecurity is a cost. You cannot make money on cybersecurity. You get something you have to spend. But if you think about it, you know, the average cost of so $36,000, a, a multi-factor authentication tool does not cost you $36,000. So by having a little bit of prevention, you can prevent larger issues down the road. And the other issue is once a company gets hit, the chance of them being compromised again is about 48%. So in other words, you get hit once, they're coming back because they figure probably won't do the things you need to do to protect yourself. And then 94% of malware and ransomware attacks were delivered by email. So I put this stat in simply because, again, they're not hacking in. They are just using easy things that allow someone to click a link or, do so, or go to a website in an email that will get you in. And, that, and this has been true from the dawn of time. 90% or more of network intrusions existed because someone clicked a link or opened an attachment that they weren't supposed to that allowed someone in the network. I'll give you an example how easy this is. So there was an entity in the US government that does what's called red teaming for the government. In other words, they act as bad actors to try to get into networks. And so they were tasked to, um, to infiltrate a fairly secure government installation in the Midwest. And so they did it two ways. They did it by network and network intrusion and by physical intrusion. We're not going to talk about the physical part, how they did that, but they use, had to use the network part first because what their goal was, was there was a file in that organization's network they had to kind of try to obtain. And if they could, it would show that the organization wasn't as secure as they thought. So needless to say, they got in and got the file and how they did it was they sent an email 
to 34 of the 400 people that worked at this installation. And what the email said was, and it looked like it came from the IT department is, in the attached spreadsheet, if you have not clicked on, I'm sorry, if you have not taken information security training for the year, your access will be denied on Friday to the network. Check this spreadsheet to see if your name is on it. So the question I always ask in presentations um, is how many of those 34 people clicked on that spreadsheet, which had malware, which infected their machine, and that allowed these red teamers access at that point. So how many of those 34 people click that link? And most people will say 30, 32. The answer is 40 because they sent that, they forwarded it to other people who also clicked the link to see if they were on the list. So the point being, and this is the biggest problem, and I'll say it three more times before this presentation is probably over, someone always clicks the link. So at a very minimum, you need to educate folks as to here's the things we know and we can do to prevent a lot of the cyber risk. Because a lot of the stuff I talk about, I will talk about in this presentation, can be done at very little cost. It's just largely awareness training and things like that. Okay, so from the 2021 FBI IC3 cyber crime report, this shows the different business sectors victimized by ransomware. Now, one thing you'll see, you don't see the legal industry here. Um, and it may be they didn't measure it that way. But what you do see are business sectors that likely your clients exist in. So I say all that to say, let's say that you have a client that is in information technology, right? And they get hit with ransomware. Who are they calling first? Well, they're probably calling you because they probably have to deal with cyber insurance in some way, shape or form. But then the problem is, chances are that ransomware got in through email. And it's a likely or possible that, because what bad guys are doing now when I talk about ransomware is they're getting into networks initially stealing all sorts of data from the victim and then launching the ransomware. So what they'll do is find out who are the partners of these companies and they'll send the partners emails who then they click on the link and then they get hit with ransomware. So all that to be said, you know, especially here we go, healthcare and public health. Um, I would say number two actually is um, educational facilities now, but healthcare and public health, you know, you gotta really concern yourself with what am I getting from my clients? And is there an attachment or a link I'm supposed to click on? And should I, or should I not? So again, this is, again, all this is just for awareness. Understand this is how they're getting to you. Um, and you can come up with ways at very low cost to prevent that from actually happening. So a couple cybersecurity essentials for law firms. I can spend a lot of time here, but just again, all of this is awareness. If you can understand the threats targeting you, you can assess your risk, proceed wisely. So first one is encryption. Your data should be encrypted at rest and it should be encrypted in transit. Chances are, if you're using a third party for your cybersecurity, this is already happening. Um, if you're keeping all your stuff on premises, you may wanna make sure you have someone checking to make sure your data is then encrypted. Again, what that does is even if the bad guy steals your information, you can't do anything with it because it's encrypted and unable to be read. Employee training, key part here. In other words, not just you watching this particular webinar, understanding the threats and things like that. Are your employees understanding it? What are you doing for them to make sure they're not clicking links? They're not opening attachments, things like that. And the thing with employee training is you need to make it meaningful and frequent, meaning not just the once a year PowerPoint, watch this PowerPoint, or read this PowerPoint, click on the, the uh, document at the end that says, hey, I watched the PowerPoint and I'm good, I'm good, I'm secure. My um, compliance, I'm good with compliance because whatever it'll do is whip through that PowerPoint, forget about everything in it, and then makes you a potential victim. Uh, and so with frequent and meaningful training, this means not just business oriented training, but give them information on threats to their family, their home network, because that's what makes it meaningful. Say, okay, we've talked about not clicking on links, having strong passwords, but have we talked about sextortion for people's families? So give them information and it has to, it can be short, 15 minute, here's the May cybersecurity 15 minute video on whatever topic. Do it twice a, twice a month, yeah, 15 minute video. One that has to do with how to protect your, your business information. One, how to, how to protect your family and your personal information. And then vendor vetting, you know, if you're sending all your information to a third party, have you checked to make sure that their cybersecurity is good? You know, if not, you may want to just say, hey, show me your recent cyber risk assessment. 
show me your recent vulnerability scan. I want to make sure that you're at least looking at cybersecurity because you're supposed to be doing it for me or that you don't have, or if it's not even a cybersecurity entity, if it's someone that has poor cybersecurity as well, that can infect you down the line. So bring your own device guidelines. In other words, do you really need that Alexa on the corporate network? I had a company call me once when I was with the bureau saying, hey, do you have any intelligence that shows that companies, especially in the clear defense community, should not have a smart speaker on their corporate network? My first question is, do we have to have this conversation, quite honestly? Because what you're doing is adding a device onto your network that has all sorts of security flaws. I mean, because the, the Alexa device is what's called an Internet of Things device. It connects to the Internet. There was a case in Las Vegas. It may not even be Las Vegas. There was a case of a casino that got hacked, and the bad, way the bad guys got in was through a smart thermometer. So the smart thermometer had a vulnerability. Bad guys hacked the thermometer, were able to then pivot off of the thermometer to the host network and steal personal information about the, the um, casino's big spenders, their, their whales, if you will. So personal information stolen through a thermometer. So again, ask yourself, do we need these things on the network? It should be your work computers, your work printers, your work servers. Beyond that, no need for personal devices to connect to your network. Create a guest network. If people want Wi-Fi in your business, create a guest Wi-Fi and let them have at it. It's gonna be very hard for a bad guy to pivot from a compromised machine on a guest network into your main network. And then password multi-factor authentication. I cannot say this one enough. And when I say password policies, I mean 13 characters or more is key. The, the shorter the password, the more likely it is to be cracked. But if you're about 13 characters or more, it's unlikely current technology can crack that password. Now, when quantum computing comes along, that'll be a different conversation. But for now, make them long, make them complex because there's plenty of dictionary sites out there that allow bad guys to easily crack encrypted passwords. Uh, so that's why you wanna have ones or exclamation points for ones, fours for A's, things like that. Um, but anyway, you can use password managers. I, I highly recommend password managers because people are like, I don't wanna remember all these passwords. Well, make it easy for your, for your employees to understand and know their password by giving them the tools to manage those passwords. I mean, there's, if you did a, if you, contract the company to do a dark web search of your company's domain, whatever you like lawfirm.com, you will find, I can almost guarantee you will find employees in your company whose emails and associated passwords are on the dark web for bad guys to use. That's how bad guys are using and compromising all of these victims because that information is easily available online and people duplicate their passwords everywhere. Human nature, do it the easiest way. In 2015, yahoo.com got compromised, 3 billion user accounts compromised, username and password. Now, if we are conservative and say that 90% of the Yahoo users knew that data was breached, 10% of, of 3 billion, I should really write this down because I use this example, I never do the math right. So 10% of 3 billion is about 300 million. Let's say, let's, let's go there, 300 million. Let's say 300 million. So 300 million people don't know their username and password got compromised, right? How many of that 300 million use that same password from Yahoo at their bank account as their work login? All those kind of things. Let's say 10% of 300 million. That's still 30 million legitimate username and passwords that bad guys have that they can very easily use to get into your bank accounts, into your corporate networks, into wherever. So have long passwords, chain different passwords for different systems, and multi-factor authentication is key. It's not expensive. And that is where you have to have that extra text message. Or if you use a application like Duo, it'll randomly give you a six digit number that will allow you to authenticate your user into the, into the network. Um, it's, it's a cheap solution. And if you do those two things, you basically eliminate your cyber risk or at least reduce your cyber risk by over 90%. And then have a contingency plan. What are we gonna do when we get hacked? So if you don't have an incident response plan, I'm happy to give you a pony for one or a template. Ponies, ponies is a term we use in the FBI. Template is probably what you use in the legal profession. So I can give you a template for an incident response plan, have it in place and then test it. In other words, do a tabletop. Let's say we got ransomware. What are we gonna do? Who are we calling? Do we know our local FBI? And that's another thing I'll point out with this contingency plan. Be friends with your local FBI office. Now, I'll be honest, the week I'm doing this particular webinar, FBI has not been getting good, good press, but the local, local on the ground FBI agents 
are still doing the right thing the right way for the right reason. They want to partner with you to provide you with valuable intelligence that can help keep you protected. So know who those, who your FBI partners are, join in for guard or whatever, so that when you have a cyber problem, you know immediately who to call to kind of resolve that situation. I'm going to talk about business ransomware, business email compromise rather in a bit. And if you know your local law enforcement entity, there's a pretty good chance if you get hit with business email compromise, you'll get your money back. I'll talk about that in a minute, because again, it's not if you get hacked, it's when you get hacked. So a couple concerns for any sector, obviously ransomware, malware, probably number one, because it can cost you the most money. You have data breaches uh, kind of going into association with that. Like I said, ransomware groups are now stealing your information first, launching the ransomware. When you say, I'm not going to pay it, they then extort you, say, I'm going to release all of this data from your network if you don't pay us. So you have to worry about those kind of two things in tandem now. Insider threat's a big issue because insiders have access to your data, and they're the ones most likely to compromise it. We'll talk about that here in a second. Distributed denial of service. This is a long time problem. It's been going on since the internet was existed. The first crime was kind of a denial of service. It was a worm, but long story. Um, but you will still see that. Chances are most of you on this will not have to worry about that per se. Cloud attacks, as you move more of your data into the cloud, then you're going to see more actors targeting the cloud. It's a common methodology in the cyber world. Some technology exists or becomes new. Bad guys figure out first how to exploit it. Law enforcement kind of figures out, ooh, that's something we probably should pay attention to. They're playing catch up. And then the law, legal, our, our legislators are way back to the side before they figure out how to come around to it. I mean, let's take TikTok, for example. TikTok has been around for several years. Um, the Congress just got interested in it this year. So that's a whole that's a whole webinar in itself, TikTok. If you follow me on LinkedIn, you can see all my link my thoughts on TikTok. Business email compromise, big issue for in the business community, in the legal community, in the accounting community. This is obviously where someone gets access either to your email system or the email system of one of your vendors or partners and creates the some kind of environment that requires payment of an invoice or payment to a vendor. Um, and it's done by a third party, but it looks legitimate and you end up paying it. Now, the good thing, not good, there's nothing good about business email compromise, but if you have a contingency plan and you know your FBI partners and you can, you find out you've got hit with this business email compromise within 24 to 48 hours, if you contact both your local FBI and the Internet Crime Complaint Center, which is a cyber crime intake center for the FBI, um, and report that you can, you have about an 87% chance of getting your money back. I had a company call me once and said, Hey, you know, I had three emails that I sent money to what were supposed to be vendors. I come to find out they're not really that email address. What do I do? My first question, first question was how much are we talking? He said, uh, about $1.2 million. And I said, when did it happen? He said about three weeks ago. He said, well, you're probably not getting your money back, but here's what you could potentially do. Again, knowing it, understanding it, knowing what happened and getting on top of it can, re can very much increase your, your chances of getting your money back. It's called the business email compromise kill chain is what the FBI calls it. And again, having that partnership will allow you to reach out to that partner and um, start that process to get your money back. And phishing attacks lead to all these other things because it all starts through email, someone clicking a link. Business email compromise started with a phishing attack probably. Cloud attacks, probably through phishing because someone used legitimate logins to get into the cloud environment, steal the information. DDoS is not phishing, so that one really doesn't partake, but the rest of them do. Okay, so I wanna talk about insider threat real quick, simply because, so I work in the clear defense community currently, and having an insider threat program is a requirement under the Defense um, um, Acquisition Act, what have you. Uh, so they have to have a, some kind of insider threat program. In outside of the clear defense community, this is kind of hit or miss whether companies have them or not. It doesn't have to be anything real deep or vast, but just an understanding that, you know, an insider is someone who uses their authorized access to steal your information, essentially. So basically what this, this slide says. So they're your biggest threat because they have access. They don't have to hack anything. They don't have to steal credentials. They have access to your network and can very easily download information, print out information, give it to competitors, give it to nation state actors, give it to people who are not exactly looking at your company's or your firm's best interests. So I have a couple of slides here. Like again, I said, if you want a copy of this PowerPoint, I'm happy to give it to you. So I'm not going to read all of these, but the bolded ones are kind of important. Hopefully you can see my mouse. But if these are some indicators that would show you have a potential 
insider threat issue. One is unexplained affluence. So if you have a paralegal who's driving around in a 2022 Corvette, unless their family is independently wealthy and you know otherwise, they may have an insider threat issue. Unreported foreign travel is a huge one because what will happen is, like in the, so in the, in the intelligence community, in the clear defense community, if you go overseas and you have a clearance, you have to report that overseas travel. So I ask you now, think about yourself. Do you have a foreign travel requirement in your company? Probably you, probably your law firm, probably you do not. So you don't know, you may know they're going on travel, but you may not know where. And if they're going to China or Russia on a frequent basis, something you probably want to think about, why are they doing that? Um, unless they, you know, have family there. But, you know, we had a case here in, I'm in Huntsville, Alabama. We had a case here where there was an engineering couple that worked for the U.S. Army. He was vet Vietnamese by birth. She was Chinese by birth. Um, they had an arranged marriage uh, and they worked in engineering for 20 years. They would frequently go on cruises to meet with their Chinese handler and provide top secret information to the Chinese handler. They didn't have to report that foreign travel because they never got off the boat. So that's considered domestic travel. So that's how they kind of got around it. Now, fortunately, we had someone who acted as a informant to tell us these things and we got some information. And we're able to ultimately um, get them arrested and charged and things like that. But again, think of think of those things. You know, are they doing unreported foreign travel? Ask yourself why. Uh, are they accessing information systems without a valid ballot reason? And the key one, are they downloading or printing top sensitive information without the need to know? So if you don't have a system in place to measure your printing, to look at who's downloading, think about incorporating something to that nature to at least keep track of it. May not mean anything bad is happening, but it could be the first thing that kind of shows you that there's an insider threat issue that we should probably look at because this is going to cause you the biggest heartburn, the biggest pain, and it's probably your biggest threat you have to consider yourself or consider for yourself. A couple of other indicators. Um, do they discuss or gain access to sen sensitive information without a need? So, you know, that paralegal down the, down the hall is coming and asking you about a business dealing with another company. Why are they asking that? That's your quite a question you have to ask. This was the case here is the, the Chinese engineer she never actually downloaded anything top secret. She got someone else to do it for her. She said, hey, that, that program you're working on, I'm interested in. I want, to, I want to move from where I'm working now to what you're doing. Can you show me some stuff on it? She would take that information and pass it to the Chinese uh, in that respect. So again, those are things just kind of look at because insider threat is going to be your biggest issue that you should at least start thinking about. So you can kind of lock your system down. I mean, I have a, from a counterintelligence perspective, one easy way to around this is, to create a fictitious folder on your network that only say your CEO, your IT manager and your security officer know and title it something, something obscure. If anybody goes into that network or into that folder that only you guys know about, you know you have a problem because why would anyone go into this fictitious folder? And you could fill it with fictitious information, um, but that'll give you a kind of a heads up that someone's rooting around in your network looking for stuff that they're not supposed to. And this could not only be an insider, but it could be an outsider who's just in your network and you don't realize they're there. So there's a lot of things you can do that are counterintelligence oriented that can go a long way to helping protect the data in your network. These are some of the consequences of an insider attack, obviously. Ruin business reputation, disclosure, trade secrets, stuff like that. A lot of bad stuff can happen if an insider compromises your network. So how do we protect ourselves? We've talked all these bad things. We, knew, we now know you're all, your heads are exploding because all this bad stuff, how do I possibly get in the way of not having this happen to me? Well, fortunately, this slide will kind of give you some ideas to think about to start you down the road of protecting yourself. And most, I don't think anything I have on this slide will really cost you much or anything other than perhaps multi-factor authentication. But um, so first off, just know email is the main attack vector. So if you can at least educate your personnel to be careful on what it is they're clicking, hopefully in your email system, you have a banner that shows an email coming from outside of your internal network. That indicates that if I'm a paralegal and I get an email from my boss, but it's got a banner that says this comes from external to the network, you can at least start to question it and say, okay, maybe he sent it from home. And you can reach out and say, hey, did you send me this email? He can confirm yes. But let's say you get unsolicited email and you click on it, bad things can happen. I got that today. So I got an email today saying I had to sign a document for payment of some invoice for $600,000. Well, I know I didn't purchase anything for $600,000, so I sent that to our phishing email 
um, e you know, sorry, mailbox for our forensics guys to look at. But I mean, there are ways that you can limit this risk with simple tools um, within you know, your Outlook or your email server. Know that the dark web and password use, reuse, reuse rather is the cyber criminal's best friend. So again, going back to the whole password thing, have complicated passwords, have people change them. You don't necessarily have to change them every 90 days like people will, will recommend. Just make sure that people are keeping good password, um, ma password management policies in place. Long passwords, multi-factor authentication. Don't use the same password everywhere. Um, we did a dark web of our CEO and our other executives in our company found that one, one individual had been using the same password for 16, since 2016, hadn't changed their passwords in 2016, and it was available on the dark web, making obviously the network very vulnerable. Identify your mission critical accounts. In other words, what's the more, what are your crown jewels? What's the important thing for my company that I need to concern myself with that I need to protect? And for those accounts, who has access to them? Does everybody need to have access everything on your network? Again, if not, then create a uh, access control list and allow people in where they need to be and keep them out of where they don't need to be. Again, creating and remembering passwords. I'm gonna password multi-factor authentication, two big things. Um, there are password managers that businesses can buy that are relatively cheap that everyone can then use. And then they can, makes it very easy not to worry about remembering your passwords. Um, all my passwords use 20 characters. I use a password manager called Keeper Keeper password. And it's very easy for me to create a complicated password because I just basically hit a button and it creates a random password chain of 20. I can copy it, paste it into a login screen and I'm good to go. Enable and embrace two-factor authentication. Come up with some methodology to have this in, in, enabled in your network, in your email, anything business critical, and in your personal life. Turn this on. Your social media accounts, your email, your financial records, make sure you have that. If every entity now pretty much offers two-factor authentication, if you have an investment firm where you say you invest all your money and they don't give you a two-factor authentication option, move your money somewhere else. Um, it's easy to turn on. It's a, it's a simple, here's a button, here's my, um, my cell phone number, or you can put an app on your phone, which is even more secure because bad guys can get around two-factor authentication. This is not a 100% solution, but you can reduce that risk even more by having an app, um, Google Authenticator is one, Microsoft has one that will um, allow you to use your app to get that second level uh, authentication, the six digit code or what have you, and you have access to it. I mean, honestly, if someone gets your phone and they're able to get into your password manager or your multi-factor authentication device because they have your phone or they have you, you've got bigger problems than whether they're getting into your network. So turn those on, embrace it, use it everywhere. Identify business email compromise keys. In other words, have a policy or a contingency plan in place to look at how you do spending. How do you, how do you pay vendors? How do you pay invoices? You know, don't rely on an email to be legitimate if you're sending out a large amount of money. A couple of suspicious things. If you get an email from the CEO saying, hey, here's an invoice of something I purchased. Um, I need to pay it by five o'clock today, but I'm traveling. I'm currently on an airplane. I can't, can't talk to you please send this, question it, go talk to somebody else and make sure it's legitimate. That's happened many, many, many times where the finance office gets an email, looks like it's from the boss and they send out $500,000. The boss says, hey, why'd you send out this $500,000? Well, you sent me this email. I didn't send that. And so again, and this goes back to other things here with the, uh, you know, having, you know, um, protections in place for email, stuff like that. Understand ransomware protection. In other words, back up your, back up your files, back them up, offline um, and test them to make sure that they still work. Secure your technology. In other words, only allow those things on your network you know you can maintain and secure. Don't allow the bring your home, your own devices from home stuff on your network and make sure you keep them patched and updated. Every time there's an update to Microsoft, every time there's an update to Apple, it means that they found a vulnerability in that software that's ex ex um, exploitable. So make sure you have a patch updating on a regular basis. A lot of companies don't do that because you, you have the one IT guy who is responsible for everything. He can't get to it also, but it's something you should at least look at to prioritize so that your net, your technology within your corporate network and even at home is updated. I mean, go home tonight, look at your router and see how many devices you have on your home. Chances are it's over 20. Are you updating them all? And are they all on the same network? That's a whole, that's another webinar for another time. And then no knowledge is protected is the tagline I use on my, on my podcast. 
because if you at least understand the threats targeting you, you can assess your risk and you can proceed wisely. So, and for everybody, it's important to keep a cyber secure mindset. What this means is that you understand the technology is not gonna eliminate cyber risk. It can reduce it. It's not going to eliminate it. That's why you have to create your own mindset to understand that cyber is a threat or a risk, if you will. And there's a lot of people wanna do bad things to you through the online world. So just keeping that mindset in place will stop you from clicking on links, opening attachments, and doing all those things because someone always clicks a link. Education tip of the spear. So by watching this webinar, you are already doing that. You are already creating yourself a cyber secure mindset by watching this webinar, understanding all these things. And ideally when it's all over, reaching out to Jeff and his group and whoever to help continue the conversation to say, okay, what else is new? Because cyber is always changing, it's always evolving. AI is a huge thing. Chances are everybody here has looked at or used chat GPT. Well, guess who looked at it and used it first? The bad guys, figuring out how to exploit it. So if you don't understand artificial intelligence, find someone who does, follow people on LinkedIn, keep yourself educated. That will just do nothing more than ensure and help you to evolve that cyber secure mindset. And then be, again, be suspicious of email attachments and links because someone always clicks the link. So final thoughts, a couple of things to think about when it comes to cyber risk in general. Number one, data breach is not slowing down. If you look at a graph of data breaches, kind of going like this, cybersecurity spending is going like this. So we're spending money, a lot of money on cybersecurity, but data breaches are not slowing down. Because again, a lot of it, you don't have to spend a lot of money to be secure, but a lot of people rely on the latest tool technology. They buy it and they don't employ, deploy it. So just keep in mind that this is not a problem that's going away. Nobody expects to be a victim. My 20 years, I never went to a company who had hacked, who said, yeah, it's our time. We knew it was coming. They were always shocked because they always thought, I don't have anything anyone would want and they're not gonna target me. I'm too small. Bad thought process. I can tell anybody for any company, regardless of size, what their key component, what their crown jewel should be and whether or not they're protecting them and why a bad guy would want to access them. If you call law enforcement, it's too late. If they call you, it's very bad. I mean, someone's been in your network for a long time Somebody else got your data and law enforcement now has access to it and is letting you know your data is out there. You've got someone in your network. Identify your crown jewels, protect them. Figure out what's most important to your business that you want to protect and do your best to protect them. And then think of your employees as your first line of defense and educate them. The more they know, the more knowledge they have, the more protected you will be as an organization. And that is what I have. I appreciate the time. Um, I will give Jeff my email and my LinkedIn address. I usually have them on this slide, but it must have un updated it somehow. Feel free to follow me. Feel free to send me questions. Um, if you want to want me to kind of just discuss your, for 15 minutes, I'll tell you, here's what, why a bad guy would want your network. Feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to do that. No cost. Um, and anything I can do to help, please reach out. Again, thank you, Jeff, for the opportunity to uh, come talk to you folks. Thanks, Darren. Yeah, that, that was an awesome presentation, and I hope the attendees of today's session take this to heart and heed your warnings. Law firms are absolutely in the sights of cyber criminals and need to take action. At Lexby, we have an end-to-end -end e discovery platform that's cloud-based. You'll benefit from all the cyber threat mitigation capabilities that we've engineered into our e-discovery platform to help protect your firm and your client's data. By loading your case into the Lexby e-discovery platform, next generation antivirus is run on all documents, which identifies and eliminates malware before it can execute and do harm. This keeps malware out of your environment. We've implemented a bunch of other security controls that Darren referenced in his presentation as best practices, including multi-factor authentication, strong passwords, encryption of data in transit and at rest, multiple user permission levels. We have auto redaction to help protect your client's privacy and a lot more. And it's super easy to access from virtually any internet connected device. At Lexby, we also perform digital forensic collections, which again means you're not having to take direct possession of native files, which could include malware. As you can see on this partial list of device and account types, we collect all types of data for your cases. And with that, I'll ask our next polling question. Would you like a complimentary forensic consultation for your next case?
All right, I'll go ahead and close that poll. At Lexby, you also get the latest in artificial intelligence algorithms that help you quickly navigate massive data sets, help you maintain control over your cases, and help you gain the time you need to build a strong case. Lexby AI algorithms perform multimedia file transcription and search, language translation, sentiment analysis, entity detection, image recognition to automatically categorize photos, you have predictive coding, you have near duplication groupings, document comparison for comparing contracts, and much more. With Lexby, you also have comprehensive email threading. Now, I'd be surprised if less than 100% of our audience has received a phishing email. When dealing with email for your cases, you don't have to worry about those because you won't have to touch them. We'll process them in the Lexby Discovery platform and not only eliminate the cyber threats, but we'll give you complete visibility into the emails and the email threads. This includes missing emails that were either left out of a production or perhaps you're missing a custodian. So we give you the intelligence to address those types of issues while protecting you from cyber threats. At Lexby, we continue to develop the eDiscovery platform, which not only means your Lexby subscription continuously improves, but we're also creating new efficiencies and pass the cost savings on to customers. That's why we don't have to charge you for processing, file promotion, early case assessment, user fees, optical character recognition, productions, electronic endorsements, and we save you money on the hosting as well. If you've got clients that are trying to cut their legal services spend due to the recessionary climate, then you should experience a demo of our platform. It only takes 10 minutes and you'll see what you've been missing. We give you more time to build a strong case by getting you from document ingestion to review faster, and we get your productions out the door faster, and we help you reduce the e-discovery cost to your client. David Jones was concerned that he would be outgunned by his AMLA opposition. He quickly realized that Lexby was a great equalizer and helped him build his best case that delivered a winning verdict. And in this case, that verdict was nearly $9 million in his client's favor. Paige Tackett at Thompson Co. needed Lexby's speed to get some productions out the door to meet deadlines. Lexby is lightning fast and gets you from document ingestion to productions faster. Patrick Biggins needed an easy-to-use e-discovery platform to handle document-intensive cases for his boutique law firm. Lexby got him on board fast and provided the support they needed to build a strong case. And with that, I'll ask our last polling question. Would you like a demonstration of the Lexby e-discovery platform? While you're answering that, I'd like to thank you for attending today's session. We'll be making the following available to webinar attendees, a recorded streaming version, an MP3 podcast, as well as a PDF. Please let us know if you have any questions or comments about this webinar or suggestions for future topics. This webinar is part of the Lexby eDiscovery webinar series. For notices of future live and on-demand webinars as part of this series, please email us at webinars at lexby.com or follow us on LinkedIn. Also, we'd like to ask for your advice regarding our webinar series. Please complete the survey at the end of today's session. It helps us to continuously improve this program and cover the digital forensic and e-discovery topics that are most relevant to you. And with that, I'd like to thank Darren for presenting today and thank you for attending. Be sure to follow Darren Mott and Lexby on LinkedIn so you'll be alerted to the latest podcast and webinar episodes. And watch your inbox for an invite to our next webinar on best practices in eDiscovery and digital forensics. Take care.